the new thing uh, in uh, our Aspen society is that we transform these um, uh, scientific guidelines into what we call practical guidelines. And these practical guidelines are a little shorter than the original ones. And most importantly, they are transferred in, um, um, in a graphical uh, way. That means flowcharts will present the content of um, these uh, guidelines. As you can hear, see, uh, uh, see here, um, we have the five uh, chapters I just mentioned. And for each of the chapters, there is uh, one or even more figures, um, uh, namely flowcharts that explain the details of these uh, chapters. And it also helps to go quickly through these guidelines. So it's also um, a very nice tool for navigation through uh, the sometimes quite large guidelines. Yeah. For example, if we start now with chapter one, which is indication and contraindication of home internal nutrition, we come to this uh, page where we see the indications and the contraindications for home internal nutrition. Let's move to the second uh, chapter, which is uh, about the access devices for home internal nutrition. This is a more um, uh, complicated uh, chapter consisting of uh, a number of pictures. And we'll start immediately when you see, uh, click on the access uh, devices, you see uh, five sub chapters and each of them had, has at least one figure. I will start now with the access uh, devices. And here you see um, what is recommended if you do a short term home enter nutrition, um, shorter than six weeks or a long term home enter nutrition. Now about the products, um, this is a quite short uh, uh, chapter because we will not go into detail um, with regard to product requirement for particular diseases. It's more a general chapter um, uh, addressing um, standard situations. Yeah. What about the monitoring? This is also of um, uh, importance um, uh, for um, performing home and nutrition. And uh, this monitoring chapter has four sub-chapters. And here you see that uh, there are two um, uh, sub-chapters. One is about education and nutritional support uh, team. And the other one is about the infrastructure. How you can reach us. Thank you very much for your attention. Why should uh, blenderized tube feeding be proposed to patients uh, on enteral, uh, home enteral nutrition? Uh, because uh, because uh, they may get uh, benefits of phytochemicals and microbial biodiversity, because patients uh, would like a diet void of uh, uh, synthetic synthetic ingredients or ingredients which are perceived as synthetic since they are uh, produced by industries. And also uh, this may have uh, psychological benefits uh, uh, because uh, the patient is feeling that he is or she is eating what the family eats and, and this is represents a jump towards normalcy and also uh, because of bonding rituals associated with meal times. There are some purported advantages of uh, uh, blenderized tube feeding, uh, such as uh, decreased, uh, decreased reflux, bloating, gagging and retching, uh, diarrhea and constipation, vomiting, nausea, volume tolerance, feeding refusals, and reduced oral version and increased oral intake. All these uh, clinical uh, um, aspects have been suggested to be improved uh, uh, by the use of uh, uh, blenderized uh, tube feeding. Uh, of course, there are differences between home blender, blenderized tube feeding and commercially available blenderized tube feeding products. There are there are uh, uh, benefits and uh, disadvantages, uh, which, uh, as you see, are uh, quite uh, uh, quite a few. And uh, and uh, these uh, disadvantages and advantages are better uh, displayed in these slides. Uh, uh, in general, uh, the advantages of uh, a blenderized tube feeding are represented by better GI tolerance, 
uh, can, the fact that can use whole foods and natural ingredients in tube feeding, the ability to customize ingredients based on food intolerance and allergies, ability to customize micronutrient supplementation, and also because they may help transition to a porous diet. Uh, of course, uh, the advantages of commercially uh, prepared blenderized tube feeding are quite a lot. Uh, uh, and uh, and uh, first of all, the long, shelf, the long shelf life and that they do not require full, full preparation, they are easy for travel and so on. Uh, while uh, the disadvantages of homemade uh, blenderized tube feeding are represented by uh, the need of planning and preparation, uh, the need of a commercial grade blender, patient may benefit for, from an experienced nutrition professional to develop a nutrition plan, uh, there are food safety concerns in, 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 uh, in particular, the risk of contamination. And uh, uh, this uh, treatment, of course, is not uh, covered by insurance because, because this is uh, regular food, so it is not uh, uh, normally reimbursed. But what do Aspen guidelines say about blenderized tube feeding? Let's look at recommendation number 39, saying that standard commercial formula or enterotube feeds can be used unless there is specific justification for a blended tube feed. You see the grade of recommendation is zero, but there is quite strong consensus about this. Recommendation 48 and 49 also uh, um, refer to this uh, topic. As homemade blenderized admixtures are less effective than enter formulas or commercially produced whole food solutions, they should not be utilized in patients on home enter nutrition. And this is a GPP grade of recommendation with a majority agreement. And recommendation 49, as homemade blenderized admixtures are less safe than enter nutrition formula or commercially produced, produced whole food solutions, they should not be utilized in patients on home enteral nutrition. The grade of recommendation is GPP and the consensus is uh, 76%. So in conclusion, the research is improving, but it is still limited for home blenderized tube uh, feeding and virtually non-existent for commercial uh, blenderized tube feeding products. So this is a field where clinical research should uh, explore uh, the uh, benefits and cost effectiveness of this uh, uh, modality uh, of uh, home enteral nutrition. Pump or bolus infusion. Uh, there are, uh, there are uh, uh, advantages and disadvantages for both, uh, for both uh, methods. Pump infusion allows for more precise administration rate, safely allows infusion of small volumes for viable periods of time, for example, during night time, implies less patient caregiver work, but may limit patient activity. And this is extremely important in those patients who are still active. They are not bedridden, such uh, uh, patients uh, like uh, uh, ALS patients or patients with neurological uh, disorders who are confined to bed. Let's think, let's, uh, think about patients who are receiving combined chemo radiotherapy for head and neck cancer. So they need to go to the hospital to get the therapy in the morning, and then they may uh, effectively receive home enteral nutrition once they're back. Bolus infusion requires division of total feed volume into four to six feeds per day, implies more patient or caregiver work, especially if a syringe is used. It is preferably performed in the stomach and may appear to be closer uh, to regular meal time. So let's again go to see what uh, uh, Aspen guidelines say. Recommendation 30 and 31. Uh, refer to this uh, uh, topic. The method of home handle nutrition administration should be a decision of the multidisciplinary nutrition support team involved in the patient care, considering patient disease, type of feeding, tube in position, and uh, uh, feed tolerance and patient's preference. The grade of recommendation is again GPP, but there is a very strong consensus. And recommendation number 31 uh, refers to bolus or intermittent continuous or continuous infusion through a pump may be used depending on clinical need, safety, and level of precision required. Again, rate of recommendation GPP and strong consensus. And also, 
it, uh, it should be considered that the combination of methods in practice, for example, overnight continuous feeding and bolus feeding during the day can provide autonomy to patients to meet their nutritional needs, but at the same time allowed for lifestyle preferences. So this is an interesting aspect where in the future we might prescribe to active uh, uh, free dwelling patients enteral nutrition in, uh, in a combined way through bolus and pump infusion. How about uh, home enteral nutrition in the COVID-19 era? Well, Aspen and, and, and Aspen people have, uh, have significantly contributed to uh, increase the knowledge about uh, the use of clinical nutrition in uh, uh, patients uh, uh, with the SARS-CoV-2 infection and, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, have uh, provided recommendations uh, for, uh, for the um, medical uh, community. However, uh, the uh, current situation is that uh, 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 it, is, uh, it is quite clear that uh, we need uh, more uh, research in the field. And this is uh, quite uh, clearly stated in this uh, paper, uh, which came out recently in the um, JPAN. The scope of the paper was to examine nutrition research applicable to the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, the authors identified three areas, the pre-COVID, the acute COVID, and the post or chronic COVID-19. And they uh, uh, developed uh, 56 PICO plus time questions. And uh, it is interesting to see that uh, the research gaps were discovered for all the PCOT questions. And the knowledge gaps were discovered for PCOT questions in the pre-COVID-19 about pediatrics, micronutrients, bariatric surgery, and transcultural factors. For the acute COVID-19 topic uh, area, enteral nutrition, protein energy requirement and glycemic control with nutrition. And for the chronic post-COVID-19, knowledge gaps were identified for home enteral and parenteral nutrition support. So the conclusions of the authors is that multiple critical areas for urgent nutrition research were identified, particularly using RCT design to improve nutrition care for patients before, during, and after COVID-19. Now, another interesting topic is the role of uh, home enteral nutrition in global sustainability. As you know, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development adopted by all United Nations member states in 2015 provides a shared blueprint for peace and prosperity for people and the planet now and in the future. At the heart of this initiative are the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, which are an urgent call for action by all countries developed and developing in a global partnership. Well, it is interesting to think that uh, home enteral nutrition may contribute to achieve some of these uh, uh, SDGs. For example, number two, zero hunger, with the effect that home enteral nutrition may have in maintaining nutritional status of patients in different conditions also may contribute to uh, goal number three, good health and well-being, but also uh, may have an, an effect on climate action and on the uh, goal number 14, life below water, and number 15, life on land. How could it be? So besides the clinical effects of enteral nutrition, there are some uh, interesting items related to the production of enteral nutrition, not only to its delivery. One uh, uh, aspect in this respect is represented by the new EU regulation of plastics, which uh, 
contains provision uh, in line with strengthening the circular economy in the EU, and the aims are to eliminate unnecessary single-use plastic items to increase return or recycling schemes for single-use plastic packaging and to increase the amount of recycled materials used in plastic packaging. Now, although food for special medical purposes, which are those used for enteral nutrition, are exempt from the provision of Article 6 and Article 9 of Directive EU 2019-904, uh, the Commission proposal is uh, driven by the need to reduce marine waste and is focused on the main contributors uh, to this problem, that is single-use plastic contained in fast-moving moving consumer goods and, and fishing gear. So, although uh, food for special medical purposes are not, uh, are exempted for, for the provision of this article, uh, the British Special Nutrition Association member companies are committed to reduce, reuse and recycle and increase the use of recycled materials whenever possible. So clearly, sustainability is a critical point to consider in natural nutrition today. Sustainability advances are being made in the areas of manufacturing processes, packaging and ingredient usage. In the area of manufacturing, some nutritional products are now made using the aseptic formula processing. In one specific example, this reduced the energy and water usage of the formula manufacturing process by 50%. In addition, some nutrition factories are committing to targeted reductions in energy, water and waste. In the area of packaging, some packaging materials, such as formula bottles and the tetra cartons, are now recyclable. In addition, there are now lighter weight formula bottles and pouches that it reduce the amount of plastic used, as well as the cost of transportation to the end users of the products. Very important, also is the use of more sustainable ingredients, such as plant-based proteins and real food-based formula ingredients, which have a much lower burden to produce compared to animal-based ingredients. Another guidelines is the BPG BDA, from the Association of the UK Dietitian that has a group, a specialist group, is particularly working on the uh, nutrition for uh, critical care. Those guidelines is absolutely very strong towards the direction of using feeding pumps. Bonus feeding should only be considered in the ICU patient if no feeding pump is available. Why? Because uh, it its benefits are very important uh, with reference to the gastric emptying, to the blood glucose control. So both for pre-existing diabetes patients, but for every type of patient, they are um, showing very important benefits for uh, the choice of the use of pumps. But the same group, the BDA, um, during the pandemic period, at the beginning of that, in April 2020, wrote a document of best practices, of recommendation, that was specifically designed for the very particular moment we were living in. Uh, how can we reconsider the use of, um, of bolus uh, also in intensive care unit settings? Uh, they can be used mainly in that document for two reasons, both either clinical or nursing reason, we will see which ones, or something quite new for the, for the hospitals and the uh, home and the care settings in Europe, the lack of nutritional pumps due to the very elevated numbers of hospitalized patients, very high numbers of hospitalized patients. So, what was suggested in the document. Select very carefully the patient. For bolus feeding, a patient must be selected. They suggest to avoid it in prone patients, even if I have to say 
in many European and also Italian experiences, we found some interesting case reports about pronated patients that were fed with bolus using the very short, very little periods uh, that we had between one pronating time and the following one. So the suggestion for that type of patients was select the patient, avoid every time that the we don't have um, a clinical stability, and avoid, avoid it uh, in patients that have something abnormal at the level of the GI tract that is already known. For example, a gastric band or a previous gastrectomy or a RU and Y uh, previous surgery. We can be helped with this approach by adopting, by using uh, a bundle also about nutrition. What is a bundle? A bundle is something that mainly involves uh, the, role of, the role of nurses in critical care, but is something that must be shared by all the uh, physician, nursing, dietitians, uh, physiotherapists, etc is a sort of structured way of improving the process of care and patient outcomes. So it is organized as a small, straightforward set of evidence-based practices, general three to five, six, no more, that when performed correctly and reliably have been proven to improve patient outcomes. Why we have to talk about a nutrition bundle when we focus on different methods of enteral nutrition. Because as we all agree on the fact that malnutrition in hospitals is often overlooked, underdiagnosed and untreated, enteral nutrition remains in the intensive care units area, one of the strongest instrument, one of the strongest tools we have to prevent and fight malnutrition. This is why many nursing protocols are now including a nutrition bundle um, whose components are usually the assessment of malnutrition, the initiation and maintenance of enteral nutrition, reduction of aspiration, implementation of enteral feeding protocols, avoiding the use of gastric residual volume that has no more benefits, no more evidences in recent literature that uh, can be absolutely uh, avoided when we know the patient, when we use uh, safe and secure nutrition protocols. And using parenteral nutrition very early only in those patients where enteral feedings cannot be initiated or do not reach the nutritional the, the, the completely coverage of the nutritional needs. So implementing the nutrition bundle can help ensure that patients receive adequate nutrition. And in that type of bundle, we can also consider something about how, in which way, with which method, how we feeding enterally our patients. Just a few words about a new experience we are just going to, to do to test the impact of a new SimpLink technology in home care and health facilities. In our experience in our center, we uh, focus on the use, in, uh, the use in home care settings. The idea was evaluate, understand, compare uh, a new type of administration that can, can allow the direct link between the, the tube, this um, nasogastric tube or the, or the PEG tube uh, with, um, with, with the bottle, with a small bottle that can be directly connected uh, without the use of syringe, without the use of uh, glasses, uh, also with some interesting aspects uh, um, 
in order to reduce the risk of uh, contamination, so considering the hygienic aspects. Uh, about 50 patients have been evaluated in this uh, first studies. Uh, we um, only had experience in home care settings, as I said before. Those patients who are appreciating more, who, are, uh, who have very high uh, level of satisfaction, are those who already used a bolus feeding with other type, with we could say less comfortable types of uh, administration. They had to use the glass, they had to use the syringe, they had to pay a lot of attention in order to reduce the risk of hygienic contamination. While this close, uh, closed system is absolutely helping them. What we have seen in the questionnaires of those patients is that 52% prefer the new one, uh, almost a, a bit more than half of them, while 48% prefer the system they were using previously. This is mainly what happened in patient pump fed, uh, while that part of patients are those that were are using, already using bolus feeding and that with the new type of administration are finding easier, quicker, and more safe and secure. Our biggest experience, our main experience was in home care settings. Uh, what we can say is that the agreement that the new system compared to the previously rules is less messes causes fewer spills, is more portable, easier to use out of home. This is very interesting also for young patients that have some school activities, that have some uh, social activities. Uh, we don't have much experience, I have to admit, in other settings, but many nurses and many um, health professionals from the uh, nursing homes are saying that the time that is needed for the assistance and the acceptance of the patients is very, very interesting. So uh, we can conclude that uh, this type of study is showing new perspective, probably new scenarios that are absolutely not reducing the use of enteral pumps, but can add not only as alternative, but together with the use of pumps, uh, other types of enteral nutrition.